Hello and welcome to the Unboxable podcast. My name is Elena Turley, I'm your host. I help mothers recover holistic health and build a soulful, regenerative lifestyle. This is a place for rediscovering yourself, finding meaning and nurturing body, mind and soul. I am here today to share with you a conversation that I had with a lady this week about being the parent of teenagers. This seems to be a really interesting theme. What I noticed is from talking to other parents, especially of pre-teens or young children, that there's a lot of fear around parenting teenagers or just of teenagers in general. And it does seem that there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of preconceived notions around the idea that the teenage years and parenting a teenager as something to be feared. And I just want to take a moment to really think about that. So first of all, the construct of a teenager is something that's relatively recent. It's something that only really happened in the 50s. This idea that teenagers, along with that kind of rock and roll culture in America, are these kind of band of roving youths and they have their own culture. They became actually something to market to. They became an idea that that really, really came out of boardrooms and then uh, it kind of became a cultural trend and it stuck a little bit, you know, this idea that teenagers are this, a a force to be reckoned with. Now, along with that construct, there is also an idea that is really important around the teenage years. We know that adolescence is a time where apart from matrescence, that is when women become mothers, it is the second biggest amount of changes that will happen to a person's body, second only to matrescence. And that's straight out of the work of Oscar Soralach, who his, uh, his book, The Postnatal Depletion Cure, he did a lot of research into matrescence. So he discovered that those changes that happen to a mother are actually the biggest and greatest changes that will ever happen to anyone in their lifetime, if they happen. And then The next in line is adolescence, which is an all-over system body change. It's a process and it involves changes at almost every level of a human being. So psychological, physiological, spiritual, emotional and cultural, I would say as well. So what's important about this is that, yes, adolescents are going through incredibly large changes and in fact their brain doesn't fully mature until they are around 23 or 25, which is when the frontal lobe, the part of our brain that regulates our behavior and that moderates our behavior according to social norms, the frontal lobe, our personality area, it's where we become people who are aware of the cultures and social situations that we live in. That doesn't fully mature till we're 25. So there is a bit of a lag. But Predominantly what's important for this story is that adolescents, yes, are going through a massive change. They're also trying to work out who they are in this new body, in this new set of hormones, in this new role in their life. So there's a lot in flux. There's also a lot of pressure on teenagers these days, I would say. And those pressures include academic pressures, performance pressures. The world is an uncertain and unpredictable place right now and for teenagers particularly that presents certain issues there's no path set in stone for them it's no longer a given that they will behave in any particular one way there was perhaps a time in certain socioeconomic strata where it was very obvious that you would do well at school go on to university or college and then go on to work in a career that would relatively stay the same that's no longer the status quo There's any number of ways that people can experience their trajectory into adulthood. And what that brings with it is a huge amount of uncertainty. So it's little wonder that adolescents are floundering. Mental health statistics are really high at the moment that there are adverse effects on the mental health of teenagers. They're not always well supported. And sometimes I think that is due to the fact that we don't really understand or we've lost our understanding. We've also lost the practice of rites of passage. So where there used to be religious or cultural practices around acknowledging that a person is moving from one state to another, from childhood to adulthood, we've often lost those. And I know that in our family, we try to emulate and integrate 
the practices of our various cultures because we're a mix of cultures. And we do try to create certain experiences that are a little bit along those lines. Let's acknowledge, let's talk about, let's bring into our rituals and our, I guess, just seeing what's going on and talking about it and acknowledging it and celebrating it and maybe even equipping our teenagers to move forward into adulthood with some support, knowing that they are supported, knowing that they are undergoing a process that has happened for thousands of years. And I think it's really important to do that as best you can. It's not always easy to work out what is your version of that ritual. You may not have a cultural practice. But I would say that there is a lot of evidence supporting the idea that teenagers really need more than just their parents. They need other trusted adults. So just as we do celebrate births or baby showers prior to birth, it would be great if we can also celebrate teenagers becoming adults and bringing in their trusted supporters, whether they be uncles and aunties or friends of parents or mentors, coaches, sports coaches, whoever they might be. And and those people have a really big part to play and a really big role to play in offering a teenager an alternative to talking to their parents but still having someone to talk to. So when something seems to be going on and your teenager doesn't feel like talking to you, you are able to then potentially suggest that they speak to somebody else and that it be a confidential conversation. So those things are really important. But one part of this story is just that there's so much misunderstanding and misconception around the teenage years and what it means for a parent. I know for me, I had had the fortune of seven years of single parenting with my oldest son. So when he became that age and we had moved overseas, we had moved to Bath in England and he got to that age where he was wanting to push the boundaries and he was wanting to go out with friends, you know, and do risky things. And we didn't know a lot of the people he was spending time with very well. We didn't know their families. I did my best to meet the families of the kids that he was hanging out with. But we did have very good communication. And yes, there were moments of challenge, but overall... I did trust him and and we did have fairly good communication. We also were very, very fortunate to be able to seek out some other people that could mentor him, one of whom was a rugby player, an amazing rugby player called Leroy Houston, who went on to play for the Wallabies and the Australian team. He was amazing. Him and his partner, for a brief time when we got to Bath, were able to mentor him. Leroy, being from New Zealand, having a similar culture, was able to step in and speak to him in a way that I wasn't. And able to and that was really powerful and that really demonstrated to me the great value of having somebody else in our circle somebody I trusted somebody who was really a respected adult someone that my son looked up to and that really made a difference and I was so incredibly grateful for their input at the time also the fact that it kept him in connection with his culture So there are ways that we can creatively, and it's a funny story really, I actually found him on Twitter and asked him if we could come and meet him because I didn't know anyone else from my son's culture in Bath at the time. And he very generously, him and his partner very generously kind of took us in. You know, so sometimes we do need to be a little bit creative and I remember feeling very silly doing that, but it was amazing, the result. It was a beautiful result. But overall, I think the thing was that I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid of my son at that age. But I know from speaking to other parents that it's pretty common. People often say, oh my gosh, I'm terrified or I have no idea how I will look after my kids when they're teenagers. They have a lot of fears. They feel that the stakes are higher. These days there are concerns around the kind of children or young adults that teens might be exposed to. There's a lot of obvious concerns around drugs, vaping, health concerns. There's all of the concerns also just around the internet and what they'll be exposed to in terms of pornography or just general visuals on the internet that they can access through either their own media or their their friends' media devices. And the biggest fear that I hear most is, will they make the right friends? So what I would say to that is the more that we can ask our children questions and invite them to think for themselves, to listen to their guts, to really trust their own intuition when it comes to their choices. Give them that overarching principle 
of listening to their body, when their body tells them that something isn't right, when their gut tells them that something isn't right, you would hope that they listen to that. And that a lot of that comes back to how have we parented them? Are we giving them, when they're younger children, are we giving them opportunities to think for themselves? When they have a problem or they feel uncomfortable or they ask for help, do we help them to solve their own problems as best as possible? Do we ask them questions that invite them to think for themselves, that invite them to find solutions to their own problems? Do we ask questions like, what do you think we could do about that? And then wait and then pause and let them come to the answer. Or do we just quickly come in and solve problems for them and answer problems for them? Sometimes it is really helpful to be able to actually offer them the opportunity to think for themselves. Now, I'm not denying things can go wrong. There will be moments where children will make mistakes, where young adults will push the boundaries. And I'm not saying you won't be tested. Of course, that happens at any stage of parenting. But the best thing that we can do to equip ourselves for those moments is to trust ourselves and trust our children as best we can and minimise the risks where possible. That means be aware, get to know, get to know the kids they're hanging out with, get to know their families. Don't be afraid to reach out in the same embarrassingly awkward way that I did to find the support that you need. Ask your people to step in at those moments. Ask them for help. Be vulnerable. Show your children when you make mistakes what you do to make things better. Be honest with them when you feel vulnerable, when you make a mistake, when you overstep the mark, parenting them too hard or restricting them too much or letting them go too much either way. Own it. Talk to them honestly. And the more honest you can be with your children, the more you can model the way that you address those moments of difficulty and challenge and when you've gotten something less than optimal outcome. That is the way that you show your children how to respond when they do that. But the most important thing I think I probably ever did with my son is I said to him, there will be moments when things happen that you'll need to tell me because of safety, because of you'll need help, you'll need the help of adults. If you ever need me to bail you out without making any comment, without saying a word, without questioning you, without asking for details, you tell me. So I said to my son, if there is a moment where something happens that is just out of your leg and you don't know what to do and you know it's serious and you know you could get in a lot of trouble, you come to me and you say, Mom, I need your help. I don't want you to say anything about it. I know I've messed up, but I just need your help. And I will zip it. I will make no judgment. I will keep it confidential. I will keep it a secret if you want me to, but I will help you. I will be there for you. And what that does is it ensures that if anything really serious goes down, they know they can call upon you, no matter what. It doesn't mean there's no consequences. You can address the consequences and you can tell them that. You can say, yes, I will handle it in the moment. And yes, we will talk about consequences afterwards. But in the moment, if you need my help unconditionally, it is always there. And that's really important. And what it meant that when those things did happen with my son, I was able to know about them. I was able to mitigate the consequences of that for other people. I was able to handle sensitive situations in ways that only an adult can, that a young adult or a child cannot. So that was a really powerful thing. It also meant that I trusted he would tell me, which meant I was less fearful So when he went out and was at places where I didn't know anybody, he was going to parties or whatever as he got a bit older, he always had the sense that if he really needed me to bail him out, he would call. And he did a couple of times and that was really good. And nobody knew any more about it and nobody got in trouble really because of things that went down. But also nobody went to hospital and, you know, I was able to, to mitigate the situation in a way that kept it still legal and safe, right? So that's really important because I think kids do know when things are escalating and kids generally are. If you have given them those tools, they are able to navigate those things a lot better or at least know when to ask for help. So I remember being in a supermarket queue once when we first moved back to Australia and I was a bit worried about him again meeting new people. He was about 14. I was worried about him going to parties and trying to prove himself socially in a new place. And I met this guy in a supermarket queue and he told me he was about to go to the pub 
with his teenager. And I was like, that's awesome that you go to the pub with your 19 year old. And he said, you know what, if I had to give you one piece of advice, just stay close, just stay close with them no matter what. And I thought that's the best advice anyone has ever given me about being a parent of a teenager. And it's true. And I say it all the time now, just stay close no matter what. And that way you've got their back. They feel supported. And most of all, you're with them. You're with them through this huge change. You're with them through this massive process. And you know, it could take a couple of years and there's a lot of research about how to do that. I'm not going to go into great detail here because it's very personal as well. But whatever you can do to stay close with your teenagers and up to the teenage years will help. And you know, just my mum always said to me as well, another really brilliant piece of wisdom was take them seriously, not literally. So when they say those really extreme things, I hate you, I da 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 da, whatever it is, take them seriously, know that they're having a big feeling, but not literally and just stay close. So that is my reflection on parenting teenagers. I hope it has been of some assistance to you today and I'll see you next time. If you have enjoyed this podcast that I produce and release for free, please like, share, subscribe and follow me on Instagram at Soul Mama Hub.